Welcome back to the second season of 12 Days in March. In the next two videos, we will cover the key material required to negotiate your way through shock-related vignettes. Just by way of definition, shock is most easily defined as a life-threatening condition due to circulatory failure. The physiologic state of shock is traditionally broken down by broad categories. For purposes of this discussion, and step one, the categories of cardiogenic, distributive, or vasodilatory, and hypovolemic shock are sufficient. Obstructive causes such as saddle embolus are discussed in the pulmonary hypertension section, and these vignettes aren't typically presented with shock. Similarly, mixed etiologies such as acute adrenal hemorrhage secondary to sepsis will have other derivative questions such as hypothalamic and pituitary responses. In terms of shock derivatives, the USMLE will typically present a shock scenario and use it to introduce questions about end organ failure. These end organs include the lungs with appropriate ARDS derivatives. They will present renal manifestations of hypoperfusion with corresponding questions on acute tubular necrosis or more rarely diffuse cortical necrosis and or the combination of pulmonary renal disease and the acid-based disturbances which accompany shock. Similarly, almost all DIC questions will be presented in the context of shock where derivatives on the laboratory parameters will be assessed. The notable exception will be the presentation of acute promyelocytic leukemia, which they are apt to query you on the typical chromosomal translocation of 1517. All the end organ manifestations will be presented with the specific organ systems and not further addressed herein. Finally, in part two of this video series, we will address shock-specific scenarios focusing on typical presentations and appropriate pharmacotherapy. Truth told, pharmacotherapy is the big ticket item in the shock vignettes. So let's jump into shock 101 focusing on cardiogenic, vasodilatory and hypovolemic etiologies. Notice I've abandoned the term distributive in favor of vasodilatory. In fact, that is what occurs and it's just easier for me to envision. So let's start with the traditional parameters. Students are asked to memorize the cardiovascular response to the different forms of shock. These parameters include ejection fraction, expressed as the percentage of blood ejected in one cardiac cycle, the cardiac output, the venous return, variably expressed by preload or end diastolic volume, and systemic vascular resistance, also referred to as total peripheral resistance. Whereas these parameters generally tie students up in knots, my approach, with a little bit of common sense, render these quite intuitive. To work your way through these parameters, just consider the category labels. Cardiogenic shock is a failure of inotropy. The Frank-Starling law has the ventricle compensating through increased stretch, also referred to as increased end diastolic volume. Sepsis and anaphylaxis reflect a complete failure of systemic vascular resistance, and hypovolemia is just as it sounds, low blood volume. To work your way through the cardiovascular measures, you are encouraged to think big, very big. In so doing, you will realize how intuitive these measures are. Not to beat it to death, but in cardiogenic shock, think of the biggest, most dilated left ventricle chamber you've ever seen. Consider just how bad the inotropic activity of that pump will be. For vasodilatory shock, envision zero afterload and preload. All that blood is pooling in the periphery. Think how happy the heart is when it can pump against zero resistance. And finally, with hypovolemic shock, Envision that the patient has only one red cell left. Think about how the body responds and how the left ventricle will pump that single red blood cell. With these thoughts and images in mind, let's proceed. So what happens to the ejection fraction in a patient with cardiogenic shock? That is, a left ventricle that can barely pump. Pump failure means decreased ejection fraction. But what about the heart that is operating against zero systemic resistance? Will that ventricle have trouble ejecting blood? No, not at all. This is one happy ventricle. And what about the patient with hypovolemia pumping that one red blood cell? Would it have any problem pumping that last cell forward? Not at all. So here are the results. Cardiogenic shock has a decreased ejection fraction or percentage. The heart has compensated with expanded preload and end diastolic volume, but only ejects a small percentage of the blood. On the other hand, the patient with vasodilatory shock 
easily ejects blood in the absence of afterload. And the hypovolemic patient has no blood, but whatever they have is surely being ejected. Now let's apply that same logic to cardiac output. By definition, the patient with pump failure will have a decrease in cardiac output. Recall, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. The patient with pump failure is unable to generate stroke volume. How about vasodilatory shock? Same story as with ejection fraction. No resistance to blood flow, so stroke volume is able to increase. And how about the patient with hypovolemic shock? Again, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate and there is no blood volume. So what happens to the cardiac output? We know the ejection fraction increases because this refers to percentage of blood ejected, but cardiac output is dependent on the volume of blood present. So this is what we have, a failing heart with decreased cardiac output, vasodilatory pumping against no resistance increases cardiac output, and in hypovolemic shock, with no blood volume present except that one red cell, the cardiac output is diminished. So let's proceed. What happens with venous return, also called preload or end diastolic volume, which are all depicted in this slide? This is straightforward. The failing heart, that is the big baggy failing heart lacking adequate inotropy, is totally dependent on preload to maintain any cardiac output. By definition, the preload is increased. What about the patient with septic or anaphylactic shock? We've already said this patient lacks vascular tone and blood is pooling in the periphery. Predictably, the venous return is decreased. And not to beat our hypovolemic patient to death, but if they have no blood, by definition, they have no venous return or preload. Intuitively, the end diastolic volume is decreased. And here it is, just as discussed. Vasodilatory and hypovolemia are noted with decreased venous return and preload, whereas cardiogenic shock is preload dependent. So finally, what gives with systemic vascular resistance? Recall we are talking about shock, so there will be an increased response of the sympathetic nervous system with release of catecholamines. Their job will be to maintain mean arterial pressure through increasing total peripheral resistance. So what happens in the patient with cardiogenic shock? The sympathetic nervous system is alive and well, so peripheral resistance increases. What about the patient with vasodilatory or distributive shock? By definition, they've lost vascular tone. Catecholamines may be high, but the peripheral resistance is decreased. And what about our hypovolemic patient with one red blood cell? They too have increased sympathetic tone with increased resistance. That is, the response of the vasculature is fully intact in the hypovolemic state. And here you have it, the full range of cardiovascular responses to the common shock states. So this is great stuff, except for one little problem. I've never seen a single question on any of this stuff. All the questions seem to focus on derivative topics. So what are those derivatives? As we saw earlier, shock is a gateway condition that leads to discussion of target organ failure, and more specifically, these are the scenarios in which pharmacotherapy is introduced. So we will stop at this point, and in part two of the shock modules, we will review the specific shock scenarios and the key pharmacologic agents you're expected to be familiar with in the step one exam. If you have any questions or concerns about any of the material presented so far, feel free to email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.